Well, good make- morning, everybody. We're we're taping this on a beautiful, breezy, sunny September morning, the best month of the year in Carlisle. And we have what I've learned to be uh, one of the most interesting programs we've had in a long time. Um, with us today are Liz Chaussey and Nick Schumacher, who are um, therapists. One a neurotherapist, Liz a neurotherapist, and Nick a physical therapist uh, from the Clow Center uh, Family Center for Rehab and Sports uh, Therapies at uh, Emerson Hospital. And um, we're going to learn a lot more from them in a few moments. And uh, also with us today, Joan Ingersoll, our fearless leader for the Council on Aging. Jean Bagnashi, uh, who is the chair of the Friends of the Council on Aging. And I'm sure she'll be willing to be ready to update you on what's happening with the friends as we uh, end the year. And um, Angela Smith, of course, our our outreach and program manager will be bringing us up to date. And uh, I just have to give a hats off to Chuck Bagnashi, who's who's the uh, director and uh, producer and uh, uh, technical support person extraordinaire for uh, our monthly meetings on uh, community conversations. So thank you, Chuck, and thanks everybody for being here. And um, Joan, would you like to uh, say a few words? Yes, I would. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I just wanted to give a few updates on what's going on at the Council on Aging, how we're trying to keep people engaged and give people opportunities for connection, even during these challenging times. Um, We have increased uh, the number of exercise classes that we're offering. So if you're interested in exercise, please call the COA. We have room in almost all of our classes. Thank you to Chief Soros for enabling us to continue to use the fire station for many of those classes through the end of October. And we're also starting a couple of classes at FRS. So please feel free to call and we can let you know the schedule and sign you up. Um, We're also happy that we're going to, with the Board of Health, we're offering a drive-in flu clinic on Friday, October 2nd. We um, have a number of doses available. We don't know the exact number, but we've sent mailings out to many seniors over 65 and over who we think um, have had flu, flu shots in the past and would be interested, and you can call the COA to register. Um, and you know we can give you more information about that. That's going to be at St. Irene Church. Um, we continue to offer our, dry, our haircuts at the fire station. Those are extremely popular. Um, they're, they're, they've been full almost every time. Then we have another one scheduled in October. Um, we had a, a concert at Village Court, a trombone, or today we have a trombone trio at Village Court. So we continue to provide events like that. And, and also we had a drive-through subs and serenade where over 80 people came in to get subs uh, thanks to the uh, generosity of the friends. Um, we, we did that last week. So there's a lot going on. Transportation is picking up. Um, we're getting lots of calls and we welcome your, you know, contact with us. Um, we also have a new social worker, Carol, Carol Grunick, and she's been busy trying to get to know the community. She's been reaching out to people by phone and asking if they're interested in either a Zoom group or an in-person small group um, for different kinds of support, such as social isolation, connectedness, um, you know, anything that's on people's minds, she's going to uh, offer some groups probably starting next month. So that's just a brief thumbnail of some of the things that we're doing to um, provide you with, you know, ways to connect with each other. And um, I think I'll turn it over to Angela for an announcement from the library. Good morning. The library just wants everybody to know that they are now open for appointment for in-library browsing and computer use. The hours are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 10 to 5, and on Wednesday, 1 to 8, with 10 and 11 on Tuesdays and Thursdays reserved just for seniors. The current Art and Gleason exhibit Built and Imagined by Beth Gallstone will be on display until December 5th. Curbside pickup can still be requested during normal library hours. You can visit gleasonlibrary.org for more information or call 978-369-4898. 
Thank you. With no further ado, we go over back to Carrie. Thank you, John, and thank you, Angela. Uh, Nick Schumacher and Liz Chaussey are therapists, neurotherapists and physical therapists at Emerson Hospital. And, you know, normally they're working uh, with a lot of outpatients that have uh, sprained ankles or are recovering from knee surgery or in, Liz, in Liz's case, have, have uh, neurological uh, issues or uh, cognitive issues. And um, that's, uh, that's probably what their, their day has been most of their career at Emerson until a few months ago when everything hit the fan. And, uh, you know, here in Carlisle, we've only had 20 or 30 cases co uh, confirmed uh, with the COVID. And I believe until August, or yeah, until August, we probably didn't even have anybody hospitalized from town. So, you know, we're sitting here in the woods, fat, dumb, and happy. And uh, it's easy, especially for us seniors who are less uh, out and about in, in, in any event, to uh, get a little cocky or, or cavalier about this disease. And uh, that's the last thing we want to do. So um, I, I'm, I'm really glad that Liz and Nick are here because they've been on the front line when this thing hit at Emerson Hospital. Emerson Hospital did a complete 180 and focused on one thing several months ago, and it was all hands on deck. Uh, so no matter what you did before, whether it was treating an outpatient and a person with a sprained ankle coming in from the tennis court or whatever, it changed significantly. So uh, maybe we could start, um, I don't know, Liz or, or Nick, either one of you can start. You were doing something day one and the next day you were doing something completely different and life hasn't been the, the same since. So maybe you could sort of give us a sense of what, what that was like. Sure. Yeah. So, well, first I'll introduce myself uh, a little more. I'm, I did my, uh, uh, undergrad and doctorate at Boston University and from there I did my orthopedic residency at Mass General so my whole career has been all about orthopedics sports performance strength conditioning um, so being in the inpatient hospital working with acute neurologically and cardiopulmonarily impaired patients was not where I had planned but being a physical therapist um, we all kind of had the skills in our doctoral level training to to deal with these sorts of situations um, so you know that's just about me. I've been at Emerson for three years. Um, and we'll, uh, you know, from there, Liz, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. So my name is Liz Chassie. Um, I did my undergrad and grad graduate schooling at uh, UMass Lowell. I've worked at Emerson for the past four years and I've kind of had my hand in a little bit of everything. Um, I treat orthopedic patients, neurological patients. Um, I've done aquatics, some cancer management, pain syndromes, hypersensitivity, you name it. I've kind of had my hand in it. Um, so while some of, some of the, the things in the hospital were a little bit more familiar to me, again, still just a, from an outpatient perspective to then going inpatient and in the hospital, 100%, uh, a very different change of scenery for us. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, I could speak to our time, you know, in Emerson hospital, we were taken on as, uh, patient care technicians. So essentially we're assistants to the nurses and the physicians doing whatever was needed for the patients. So anything from helping them bathe and clean up in the morning, helping them brush some te their teeth, walking to the bathroom to um, getting vitals every four hours. So in the hospital, when you have COVID, we had to check vitals every four hours through the morning, all the way through the night, making sure there's no sudden changes. Um, we had, you know, unfortunately a few patients on our shifts pass away we'd have to go ahead and, and um, you know, go through the processes of, of what to do with that person from then on and moving them off the floor. Um, so definitely some challenging things uh, we had to deal with. We, our hours were all over the place. Both me and Liz had uh, a few night shifts during that time where we worked from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., which I didn't know I could stay vertical for. And it was amazing with the uh, support of nursing and just the community there kept us awake. And, um, you know, we um, took a lot from that experience. We were wearing a lot of protective equipment. So from every room we went into, and we went into probably between 50 and 60 rooms 
every day during a 12 hour shift, we'd have to gown up, put gloves on, put a, a N95 mask on, sometimes have to put a surgical mask on that on top of that, put goggles on and make sure we wash our hands and sanitize before going in the room and then degowning, taking everything off and changing it between times. So 50% of our time was probably just gowning up and gowning down to ensure we weren't transferring um, things from room to room because everyone on our floor for the majority of the time had COVID and that was between 20 and 30 patients at a time at its peak in March and April and that went to as low as maybe four or five towards June when we were no longer needed um, because the surge had kind of died down at that time. And a lot of these patients, again, as Nick mentioned, we were kind of going in the rooms to help them with other, whatever they needed. I don't know if you can or can't imagine, but a lot of these patients were bedridden or fairly immobile. Um, most of the people on the floor were on oxygen consistently. I know you've heard a lot uh, through the news that people with COVID um, have been on ventilators. For Emerson, most of those patients that were on ventilators were typically in the ICU, so we didn't necessarily see those folks um, as often, but we were still working with people that were frequently on oxygen and various forms of oxygen. Um, they would also be on, you know, hooked up to IVs and be receiving antibiotics and other medications. And that was probably part of the hassle too, is trying to maintain their safety with assisting them to the bathroom while managing all of their cords, um, making sure that they, they don't trip. Um, and the scary thing is, is for a lot of these people, they were, frequently reporting that they had they were having difficulty breathing um, even when they were on oxygen and that was one of the the biggest things that was kind of surprising um, and I just think that overall it's been a really kind of niche experience for us having been physical therapists we have kind of a different outlook or a different perspective on how people move and how people kind of go go about their their life and everything and I think it's really interesting for us to be techs and kind of be on now be on both sides. We kind of saw these people from the beginning and now we're starting to see them on the other side of it too, which has been really interesting. So when you're, when you're oxygen deprived or oxygen compromised, how does that manifest itself? I mean, for us, you know, not close to the situation, it's just, I, I can't imagine what it must be like uh, to have that situation. I know I have a, my own little personal, uh, Pulse ox thing that I that I use to monitor myself because I one of the things I heard was that if uh, if you're going to start coming down with symptoms, one of the first things is your your oxygen level is going to go down. You may not even know you have any other symptoms, but I, I can't imagine what it must be like to really be compromised that way, and it affects you physically. I'm certainly, but it must also affect you mentally. Absolutely, uh, both physically and mentally. Um, so from a physical standpoint, the difficulty breathing, um, a lot of folks after going through this, they have that sense of weakness and fatigue. A lot of, the, a lot of that shortness of breath or a reduction in oxygen uh, kind of manifests itself as fatigue uh, and difficulty with things that people normally take for granted, like walking across a room. Um, or getting dressed, it's, so, it's much more laboring now to do all these things. And that's something that we notice. Um, and from a kind of cognitive or mental standpoint, uh, there's actually quite a few um, kind of factors for that. So with a reduction in, in oxygen levels, that means that there's less oxygen coming to the brain. So we have noticed that some people do have a change in their cognition. Maybe that manifests as memory loss or difficulty focusing. Um, that's something that we're seeing. But then also from a mental standpoint, thinking about the emotional impact of going through this experience um, and people have either had a hard time adjusting, they may have a, like a little PTSD from the whole experience in the hospital. Um, and I think that's something that actually a lot of people have neglected is um, a huge factor um, apart from everything else that they've gone through. Well, and they're also isolated from friends and family. Yeah, and that was a lot of our time. I mean, I felt was really important and me and Liz definitely tried to make the priority was spending time with these patients and just getting to know them on a personal level and getting to know their life and what they were. Cause we, these people were probably, you know, a lot of them were in the top of their careers and they're, 40s, 50s, and now they're bedridden, 
can't work, can't see their family, can't see their loved ones. Um, so, and I would see them really light up when we'd ask about who they are and about their life besides their diagnosis and, and how they're suffering in the hospital itself. As, uh, as techs, sometimes, depending on how much, you know, how much people needed. We always carried phones with us. So if some, we were assigned to patients rooms and um, if someone called, our phone would go off. But if we had it, um, and sometimes it felt like we were running around all over the place. Um, but sometimes if we had um, a moment, it was really nice. People um, just wanted us to sit and talk with them. Um, the hard thing with that is if they were positive for COVID, we really were trying to minimize our own exposure. Uh, so it was always that catch 22 of trying to give them, you know, that time, but also, you know, try and protect ourselves as well. And I think that, um, one thing that was great that the hospital did, uh, is that they got a bunch of iPads for the for the floor. So it's one thing that we were in charge of was typically setting up Zoom meetings and trying to coordinate, um, meetings with their fans so that they could talk or FaceTime with their, uh, with their family members, which sometimes just made all the difference for these people. That's great. And um, now you're back to normal, fairly back to normal at Emerson, or how, how does that, how does it seem to you right now? So, I mean, our clinics, our clinic schedule is definitely different. I mean, each of us spend a few days, uh, I mean, all the therapists, OT, speech, PT, are spending at least one or two days a week doing telehealth, which is very new to us. Um, it's incredibly effective, and we're very shocked by how well it's been working. And the reason I think it works so well is a lot of our job is education and, and teaching people what to do and what not to do, and really just updating their exercise programs, making sure you know, they're safe in their home environments. And, you know, it's, we kind of found how flexible and resilient us clinicians are as a whole to these kind of things. And I think telehealth is something that's going to stay. And, um, you know, in clinic, having that personal touch is certainly huge. I'm a manual therapist, so I do a lot of hands-on, you know, cracking joints, cracking necks, things like that. But, you know, that's just a small piece of, uh, small piece of the recovery puzzle, right? Most of it is, is teaching them how to you know, fish for themselves and how to, you know, do their own exercises and, and get stronger and better on their own. And oh, post, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Liz. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think that um, us now having telehealth is a great option for people because um, if they don't feel comfortable yet leaving their house, well, they now have an option and they can, because physical therapy really is essential. People don't stop having back pain. People don't stop having, you know, th injuries and things don't stop just because a pandemic is happening. And I think that us having telehealth, while it's new for us and there's a little bit of a learning curve, it's, um, it's definitely been a great um, kind of option for, for us. And um, there's the added perk of us being able to work from home now, <laughs> which is nice too. Well, you post post discharge, then you've got a whole group of folks that you continue to follow up with, and uh, you know them. You've gotten to know them personally and what their needs are, and uh, uh, what what's a typical regimen at post discharge for someone? I mean, I guess everybody has different problems that they need to address, but what are some of the more likely things that uh, that that they need post discharge? I mean, the big thing is. You know, say they were going to come in to see a physical therapist after, you know, a stay in the hospital. I mean, the big things, me personally, and then, you know, Liz will speak differently to some, some different things, but I'm looking more at their aerobic conditioning and their strength, strength um, how well their strength is working, you know, uh, how strong they are. So um, from an aerobic standpoint, right, we're going to test, you know, how fast can they walk? How safe are they with walking? You know, are they super unstable on their feet? I mean, a lot of these people have been bedridden or even if they're not in the hospital at home sick for a few weeks at a time. And, you know, if you're, if you're older, it's, you can't rebound quite as quick from these things. And uh, a lot of it is just looking at these simple movements and making sure people are, are moving safely and just starting to get them on a walking program or getting them with some, you know, getting them doing some squats or some movements that kind of mimic the demands of their daily life, whether they're caring for their grandchildren or, um, 
you know, just want to get back to working out and being more active. So I mostly spend my time with aerobic conditioning and strength training. And then Liz, you can speak to the other components. Yeah. So another component of that, um, which I kind of, we kind of touched upon before, um, being unsteady on your feet. So generally when someone's coming in to see us, no matter what, we're doing a full screen. And especially if they've had COVID or been quarantined, we're doing an even more in-depth screen kind of covering everything. So like Nick said, their endurance or their aerobic capacity, their strength, but also a huge factor is their balance. Um, these folks may be at more of a risk of falling now, partially because of weakness, partially because they, um, you know, maybe that change in cognition and being able to do two things at once and they're more unsteady that way. Um, but there, if you've been sitting around, you're not really working on your, you know, you're not challenging that stability anymore. Um, so we're noticing that people may be at a higher risk for falls now, and um, that can lead to other complications, you know, a hip fracture, things like that, and we don't want that. So another whole component would be balance, balance training, fall prevention. Um, but kind of just touching on the fact that pretty much, no matter what we're just doing we're doing a full screen on everyone to see what their specific needs are like nick said maybe they can't they just want to go back to lifting their grandkids again they're a little bit weaker and that they just want to play with their grandkids or maybe they can, they're having trouble walking around their house so um a lot of our plans of care are pa very patient specific um, just getting them back to what they need to get back to or what they used to be able to do real, realistically. Well, it must be very challenging when you, you don't have a baseline, you know, how the, these folks were before all this happened of their condition. And you sort of have to say, well, you know, is this something that they've lived with for the last five years or is this something that's just been brought on by the COVID? and uh, by their being inactive for the last couple of weeks or three weeks or whatever. Uh, so it must be really difficult to kind of sort through that and find the right regimen to get them back on their feet, so to speak. Certainly, certainly. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> no, no way around that, it definitely can be. Right, and that, a lot of it comes down to just asking them questions saying hey what were you doing before this happened? Like how active were you? Were you feeling unsteady? Were you feeling weak? Were you suffering back pain before this? And a lot of the answers we can get right from them. I mean, they know themselves super well, but it does get um, tricky to discern certain things for sure. How about compliance? Are, are the compliance an issue just as much with COVID patients as with any patients? Well, I hmm. think that that's probably a, a pre-COVID uh, factor, you know, whether or not they were kind of a very motivated and gung ho person prior to having COVID, um, or, you know, or not, um, that probably is going to affect how, um, diligent they are with doing what, you know, doing what we say or, um, following up, following through with the, our recommendations or the exercises that we give them post COVID. Sometimes this is a wake up for people and they're extremely motivated afterwards. Um, but that definitely varies person to person. And some of it is just maybe who they were beforehand. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we're so busy in the clinic that these patients understand like, Hey, like you're lucky if you get it. I mean, a 30 minute session is hard to fit on our schedules just because we're seeing so many people. So people I've seen the cancellation rate is way down compared to pre COVID. I think people appreciate their health a little bit more after all this and see the importance of it. Um, so we're more here just to make them feel accountable and show up and do their thing. They don't I mean, they don't want to show up and, and say, me say, Hey, can you demonstrate this for me? And they, they don't know what the heck I'm talking about because they haven't been practicing it. So I've seen, I feel like a better, a little bit more of a carryover and a little bit more um, compliance, but still, I mean, there's a few people here and there who you can't, you can't change. So that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, when I walk over at Great Brook uh, Farm Park here in, in Carlisle, I see a lot more people out walking, walking their dogs, riding their bicycles, being very active. Uh, presumably, these are not COVID patients or anything like that, but they're just doing their typical routine of working from home and getting as much exercise as they can afford to get. So do you see a lot of people that are suffering from... <laughs> 
exercising more than they had been or doing things that they shouldn't be doing? So I've seen, I mean, I've actually seen quite a few people have taken up running since they've been off, since they can't go oh, to the well, gym. Yeah. <laughs> so, and people who, sure, they have all the ability to run and it's no reason they shouldn't be running, but they might be too aggressive with, you know, returning or they might have a little too much weakness in certain muscle groups that makes them not able to tolerate, you know, five, six miles a day. I just discharged uh, an awesome woman who she was training for a half marathon and got a really bad um, knee injuries in both legs. And it all came down to me just kind of, you know, holding her reins, kind of slowing her, her down a little bit and giving her the proper strength and exercises. So she'd get back to running without pain. And, you know, within four weeks, she was back, no issues, doing great. Um, but sometimes it just needs just a little bit of education and, um, you know, teaching people a few different things to get them going again. Well, we're very lucky to have this fantastic capability so close by to us, that's for sure. And uh, I, I also, I, before I forget, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you. I know you have patience to see all the time, you know, a full schedule. So uh, I, I want to just uh, make sure that everyone understands that uh, this has not been easy for you to break away and, and uh, help us uh, better understand this. But uh, what's your overall, what do you hope to accomplish now with based on what you've learned? Are you going to do anything other than the telemarketing or telemedical uh, visits? Uh, any other things that you want to incorporate permanently in, in the program? So I would, I would say, I mean, we want to make this COVID care team a, a long-term thing. We know people are going to be suffering with this going forward. Um, we'll probably be seeing a lot of these people trying to see them initially in the clinic to just get a good foundation and then down the road, um, seeing them, you know, checking in via telehealth. I think it's going to be the best way to go about doing this. Um, but, you know, I don't think besides that much is going to change in the clinic besides us getting this new kind of cohort of, of individuals who is new to us and nobody fully understands, you know, they're calling them in the news, the long haulers, and they're called the people who are, have been discharged from the hospital and they just aren't feeling right. You know, about 35% of people who have COVID, don't get back to their full normal lifestyle within two to three weeks. Whereas if you look at the traditional flu, most people, 99% are back. You wouldn't even know they had the flu. And there's a lot we don't understand and a lot we're learning, but you know, we're just going to base things on what we see here and now and what the impairments they're coming to us with. And, you know, these are all things we know how to train and get better. We work with awesome speech therapists who can work on cognition, occupational therapists who can work with, um, you know, more personal, you know, toileting and, and personal care type items, and then us PTs who will look more at the big picture type things. I think the key is that, is knowing that it, you know, for, for, from our perspective, that physical therapy is an option for these people. If they're noticing that things are more challenging and instead of just kind of waiting it out, it's okay to come to physical therapy. We can help you. Um, and I think that that's something that would be, is a good goal for us to strive for is just making sure that people know that we're out there to help them. So when, when you say long haulers, uh, what is a long haul in this regard? Is it two months? Is it three months? Is it, um, I'm sure it varies from person to person, but generally speaking, what are we looking at here? It, it could be upwards of months. I mean, we only have data from, I guess, from march to now and right people are still struggling with this so it's hard to know how long it'll last we know that neurological changes tend to recover a little a lot slower than orthopedic type injuries just because yeah. nerves in your brain just are slower to respond they can recover and there's a lot of neuroplasticity and potential for benefit but we're not quite sure what is driving these things and there's a lot of people smarter than me trying to figure this out and you know it's a challenge for sure how do you diagnose progress in that regard? Do you ha have them doing crossword puzzles or what do you do? We actually leave a lot of the cognitive um, therapy to the speech therapist and they've been a great asset for us. Uh, but even just from like a physical standpoint, uh, for us, we have, a, when we're evaluating someone, we're using more so objective measures and a lot of different testing measures that um, have some standards and as in, that we can actually track progress with. And it's, um, 
it's good it's good data for us and it's good for them too because sometimes it it's it might be hard to track or feel that progress and objectively we can kind of we we're able to with the certain tests that we have um, as physical therapists we can kind of show that is there any um, any sort of special uh, element of this involving sleep yeah i mean sleep can certainly be af affected by this and some people um you know, are fine. They're not sleeping as well after dealing with, with COVID. And again, that's hard to know why that is. I mean, people are excessively fatigued. It doesn't mean that they're sleeping more, but they just are dealing with the baseline fatigue that makes being productive throughout the day very challenging. Um, so we do, as PTs, we promote good sleep hygiene, good hydration, good um, diet. Um, and we try to just touch on those things because we just, we know the benefits of all these tiers of um, of health that, you know, a lot of times they don't hear um, from potentially other healthcare professionals. Um, so we try to make that a big part of what we educate on. Anything you'd like to, any closing comments you'd like to make? Come Did on, go first? <laughs> yeah. Come see us, yeah. I think people are the, I think, well, the majority of all people who start PT are so excited that they did it. I think it's, getting the initial referral to do it is kind of can be a pain in the butt to start with. But as physical therapists, um, we're direct access in Massachusetts. You can come see us without a referral. All insurance asks is that eventually you get a referral at some point, um, just as a, um, as a secondary um, thing to cover, you know, insurance. Um, so, but come and see us, it's not an issue. Just book an appointment. We'll provide you with our phone number and email. Um, so if you have any questions, reach out. The, um, I think the, the bottom line is knowing that there are, you know, if you're, you're feeling different or you're feeling the changes from COVID or you're feeling like you're not 100% yet, there are, there, there are people out there that can help you and there's hope to get you back to where you were before. Um, and we can do that for you. Well, that's, that is absolutely great. I, I, I think the takeaway for me is that we have to really guard against becoming complacent about this disease. Uh, our, you know, our audience in particular, we're the more, more vulnerable part of the community, seemingly. And uh, we can't just take it for granted that uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, flu on, on steroids. This is much worse than that. And the effects can be longer lasting. And we really need to make sure that we're taking all the precautions that uh, we've been advised to take. And uh, it's just great to know that we have this kind of a resource available to us. I think uh, as you learn more about what Angela does with her programs, with exercise programs, I think all you guys ought to be joined at the hip and, and working together because it, it sounds like there's a real uh, opportunity here for synergy. Certainly. Sounds like it. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us and for sharing your experience. And thank you for all that you've done for our community. Of course. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. <laughs> okay, Joan, I think you want to tell us a little bit about what's going on. Sure, and thank you to both of you. It was very interesting and informative and I appreciate what you're doing. Well, so some things that just, I want to make sure everybody's aware of, um, you know, kind of maybe following up to what we just heard, um, the COA has a pretty robust medical equipment loan program. So if you know that you have a surgery coming up or you've had an accident or mishap or for any reason, and you're of any age, not just for seniors, um, you can give us a call, 978-371-2895. And we have walkers, canes, wheelchairs, raised toilet seats. We have things we don't even know we have. Angela got a request the other day for something and we found it, Chuck, uh, Clyde found it. So we have a lot of different items that are in good condition and that we will loan you free of charge, drop it off for you, pick it up. So please call us if you or somebody in your family needs a piece of medical equipment. Um, I wanted to remind people about the transportation program. Um, we, there is grocery shopping and delivery going on um, through the Carlisle Neighbor Response Team. So seniors in need of groceries, pharmacy items, library books, or any, anything that's essential can call the response team, 
254-0508. And this is a free service. So um, if, you, if you're a senior and you need this, you don't have somebody else to help you, um, please feel free to call them. They're, they're happy to do it. Um, and of course, we have a transportation line and transportation services to all seniors and people with disabilities. So you can call our transportation line if you need a ride, 978-371-6690. And then something else I wanted to highlight is um, the Concord Carlisle Community Chest um, supports different agencies, organizations within Concord and Carlisle, including the COA. They were partially responsible for helping to fund our new social work position. And they're um, doing their annual campaign um, starting on October 1st, trying to raise $500,000. So if you're interested in donating, you could go to www.ccommunitychest.org and you can learn more about what they do and you can make a donation on their website. Angela? Hi. Well, we are very lucky that the curator from the JFK Museum or the retired curator from the JFK Museum lives in town. And every summer, usually he does a tour, but this summer that didn't happen. So instead he's doing a Zoom presentation for us on October 5th at 1 p.m which will be entitled Martha Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and the Presidential Election of 1960. So he's going to relay a um, great deal of details of what happened for those events. And Frank Rigg, who is the person who will be speaking, has um, some insight that is just amazing. When you do the tour with him, he tells you things that you never heard or you never realized and he spent time with those people and so it's really wonderful. So we're thrilled to have him and because of the benefits of Minuteman Media Network and also Chuck helping, we will record that talk as well. And so we're excited about that. And another talk that we're going to be doing with Chuck is um, Clyde Kessel, who not only does our medical equipment, but is our shine counselor, will be doing our annual open enrollment presentation, again on Zoom, on Tuesday, October 27th at 2 p.m. And if you want the link for that program, all you have to do is call the COA at 978-371-2895. Jean, do you want to tell us a little bit about the Friends? You're muted. <laughs> you sign, Jean? Okay, that, I, I wanted to say how much physical therapy helped me um, with back problems, so. That was very um, interesting. And most of the physical therapists that I'm aware of are of a very young age and they're very good about just, you know, sticking to the exercises. But um, today, I, it is my pleasure to talk about the annual fall cultural series that is sponsored by the Friends of the Library and the Friends of the Carlisle Council on Aging. And, um, Coming up in September, uh, Jason Gianetti, who's an immigration lawyer um, and who has spoken here in Carlisle before, uh, is going to be giving a historical overview of U.S. immigration law and policy. And uh, also in the second part of his talk, uh, Immigration in the Age of Trump. Um, and I think both of these are very timely and he's a very knowledgeable, personable, easy to listen to person. Um, you learn a lot with these series. And along with that is going to be a two, two part series in October. Um, and this is uh, exploring the origins of jazz at the beginning of the 20th century and um, the classical composers who were inspired by this new art form. So um, uh, that will be followed um, again by um, American music of the 20th century. So 
Um, to register for these events, uh, you really need to call the library. They are going to be Zoom recorded, but uh, when you call the library, they can tell you once the recordings are done, when the links um, will be available. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, is uh, the Cold War with Gary Highlander, who's again spoken here, a terrific speaker, um, great historian, but uh, this intense period of uh, political and military tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And um, so these, again, are kind of linked time-wise and are also very um, uh, timely, I think, uh, now. And again, we can enjoy these talks uh, by not having to be physically present at the library, but thanks to um, Zoom and um, recordings, we, we can enjoy them. So that's it on the cultural series. Um, Angela, is there anything else you wanted me to speak about fundraising? Can't hear. I think you wanted to talk about what the Friends has been doing during COVID as well as what they do for us all the time. Well, um, as far as the COVID, um, and the support of the friends. Um, we really, we had a, a very, very, very lovely response from our townsfolk on kind of realizing that to keep programs going and to increase support as deemed needed, um, people were very, very generous and donated, not just during our fall drive last uh, winter, but um, into the spring. So we were able to um, uh, add to the, I think it's the Good Neighbor Fund uh, that was, uh, you know, just to be there as a reserve so that the uh, COA didn't have to come, you know, for each and every um, need to the friends and basically had a little pillow to uh, fall on. Um, the COA's gone way above and beyond in terms of keeping programs going and providing norms for people to feel less isolated, whether it's mini memoirs that the uh, friends helped um, on a second go round on those, which is um, very helpful to a lot of people to, um, you know, put their memories down. And Nancy Show at West, uh, who's extraordinary at this, is helping out. But uh, Initially, the mini memoirs were um, a, a mental health grant for 10 mini memoirs, and it was a very popular uh, event. So the friends were happy to spring for uh, 10 more, and hopefully people will be able to um, participate and uh, you know, help get through the isolation. Uh, I think basically that the um, Fundraising efforts for the Friends, our fiscal year ended in June, so now we are revving up for our fall campaign. And I really believe deep down that uh, people in town will be as responsive as ever. So we'll make a push for that. And um, I, I really think that uh, because the COA has been right there in the forefront, and thank goodness for the Mosquito, which is also highlighting the COA, ongoing activities. So um, I, I think we're very fortunate and we have um, very generous townspeople and a wonderful COA. So let's keep our fingers crossed. That's it. And people can continue to donate to you on PO by sending to the Friends of the Council on Aging at PO Box 38 anytime you will take their money and we will make sure that it gets to good use. Good. And look for our flyer in late November. Thanks, Jean. Good thing. Joan. Okay. Well, a few other things that um, help to uh, combat social isolation. Um, a couple of Zoom opportunities for people that I want to make sure everyone knows about. We have Virtual Senior Moments, which is actually hosted and run by Jean and Chuck. And, you know, people can drop in, um, have, have some coffee while they talk to each other. And, you know, it's a kind of an open conversation. Sometimes there's some thoughtful questions that go along with it, but it's a really nice program. And the upcoming Senior Moments, um, we have September 28th. 
October 12th, October 26th at 9.30. And if you want to participate, you just call the COA, 978-371-2895, and we will make sure that you get the Zoom link. But it's just a nice way to talk with, you know, people in the community, um, friends and neighbors, and, you know, be able to just connect. Um, and similarly, we have digital coffee and conversation also on Zoom, and we have different people who facilitate. Sometimes that's also Jean, and sometimes it's other folks. Um, the next one is actually tomorrow um, at 1030, and we also have October 1st, 15th and 29th. And again, if you call us, we will be happy to send you a link. It doesn't matter if you haven't done it before. New people are always joining, and we, love to, we would love to have you. Uh -huh. All right, Angela. Okay, so following along with what are we doing online, we are doing a new poetry group with Patty Russo. Patty has always gotten together with our seniors in the past, one-to-one, uh, -one, and she's gonna be doing four sessions once a month called Virtual Partners in Rhyme, and it will be starting on October 14th. So if you'd like to join, call the COA, and we'll get you in touch with Patty. We are continuing our French conversation group, which is also on Zoom every Friday at 3 p.m. And they are really so involved and loving this that they've gone to weekly. Our Gleason Knitters are online once a month, uh, the first Friday of the month. And the Knitting and Service group, which I'm a member of, um, We'll actually be meeting tomorrow night as well. We meet once a month on the third Thursday at 7.30 at night. Everything we knit or crochet goes to Carmen Cathedral for the homeless in Boston. And so we will be collecting everything knitted in October. So if you want to join us on Zoom, great. If you just want to knit, you can bring it into the COA and we will make sure that it gets into um, Boston for the distribution. Last year we had close to 200 either um, scarves or hats. So I don't know what we're going to get this year, but I'm hoping that if you're sitting there at home and you're listening to us and you know how to knit or crochet, maybe you'll do at least one scarf or one hat and um, it doesn't have to be any particular pattern. The majority of the people that we're helping are homeless, um, homeless men. So dark colors are nice, but there are some women as well. So just to go on with um, what Jean said about mini projects, I just want you to know we do have seven open slots for the second round of this. So if you have always thought about recording something about your life, now's the ta time, excuse me, or if you'd love an opportunity to talk to families and friends about a particular time of your life, this is a way to give you a reason to reach out to people and get in touch. So Carrie, maybe you want to do this. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so um, it's been very well received. The people that have done it have really enjoyed their time with Nancy and their families have enjoyed getting their stories. So, Joan, back to you. Okay, well, just um, to let everybody know, um, we are continuing with the podiatry clinic um, during this time. It's at the doctor's office in Bedford. And um, the next clinics, we had three in September, and we're going to be running two in November, on November 2nd and November 9th. You can call the COA to register. And because of the generosity of the friends, um, Carl, the seniors can still pay $25 and the friends have increased their subsidy to $15. So if you're interested in the clinic, please let us know because they do fill up and you know it's an important thing for people to keep up with. And also I did mention the haircuts, but I didn't say that they're on October 26th and we're already taking reservations. We've got our two stylists ready to go at the fire station again. And like I said, those do fill up. So if you want to make sure that you get your appointment for October 26, just give us a call and we will put you into your spot. Great. And uh, to go back to more Zoom, we're, gonna, we're going to do a musical ventriloquist. And this is for all ages. So if you're listening to this and have grandkids, we're setting it up for 345 to 430 on Monday, November 9th. And we're doing it at that time just so that kids 
who may be in school should be available, but um, I've seen some of his programs online and it's really a hoot. Um, I know Linda Cabello Murphy had him do a um, birthday Zoom special for one of her kids and she said they all loved it. So that's exciting and that is funded by the Carlisle Cultural Council. We were planning this in person, but when that got changed, we um, moved to, to doing it at Zoom. We're also going to be holding, and this is mostly for seniors, so, or if you're not quite a senior, that's fine too, um, brush lettering workshop, and it's gonna be taught by one of the CCHS students. She's done this for the library, so if you ever thought you'd love to learn how to do fancy calligraphy, now's the time. Because uh, again, through the generosity of the friends, she will put together a list of um, tools like brushes and sheets of special paper, and you'll be able to call and when they're ready, you can come pick them up from the COA. And this will be uh, once, twice a month, no, I take it back, November 5th, 12th, 19th, and December 3rd, so four times, and you get to learn how to do this and enjoy it, and we're gonna record it, but not post the video, it's gonna be recorded just for the people that are signed up, so if they missed a session, it's there, or if they wanna go back and practice, because um, it's periods of empty space while everybody does their lettering, so that should be fun. Also, I am trying to get um, musicians and singers, and Carrie, maybe we can get your lovely group to do one, to do a video of a song or a piece and submit it to Minuteman Media Network. And we're trying to get all of these put together in an intergenerational music program that will be viewed around the holidays and be available just to bring a smile to people's faces. So we're reaching out to people who maybe sing or people who play a particular piece of music and are willing to be recorded by minute. Well, you record it yourself or my can hour is willing to record you if you don't have a way to do it. And then we'll send them all to Minuteman Media Network. They'll put together a program. So if you know anybody, please send them along. Anything else you'd like to add, Joan? Um, no, I think you've pretty much covered it. I mean, uh, fuel assistance season is coming up. So if you, we're going to be sending out information to people and we'll have information in our next newsletter. But if you are interested in learning more about fuel assistance, and you think you might qualify, please give us a call. We're happy to help anybody with an application or a renewal. And in that same line, we know that there are people in town struggling more than usual. And we'd like to point out that um, there are food support available. You can work towards getting your SNAP or what used to be called food stamps. And the, in our newsletter that was available for September, October was links to that. There's also, um, we're working with the neighborhood response team who's delivering groceries and also going to food pantries and helping families. And Gaining Ground has been providing fresh produce to families and seniors, uh, and they will be doing that through the month of September. And I think they're having one distribution in November. And we also want people to know that the COA, because of our friends and other donations, are here to help you. So if you have a need and you are a senior, please reach out to us. If you ever need and you aren't a senior, there is help through the Carlisle Neighbor Fund, which is managed by each of the three churches. So you can reach out to either um, Reverend Mobayed at FRS, Pastor Widely at the Congregational Church or Father Frank Silva at St. Irene's. And they have gotten some recent donations. So if you're finding you can't pay your rent or your mortgage, or you can't pay your cell phone, or you're really stuck with something in particular, please um, feel free to come forward. If you're under 60 and you're looking for other kinds of help, you can also reach out to Bonnie Wilbur who's our Concord Carlisle community 
representative and we work closely with her. And if you don't know how to reach her, just give us a call and we'll put you in touch. And I also wanna remind people that we're always looking for volunteers. And um, right now we're taking volunteers that do Meals on Wheels delivery. We're taking volunteers that help with programs that uh, some of the volunteers are helping walk people back and forth between haircuts in their car or between the podiatry doctor's office and her parking lot. We're having people call with um, questions about your health. Jean spent a whole bunch of time this last weekend calling and asking COVID questions to make sure everybody's well and safe before they went for haircuts. So we're always looking for people and we definitely want to encourage people who aren't just seniors, um, you know, maybe you're 50 in your home and you're working out of your house. Everything we do, we're not checking your driver's license and we don't care. And that goes for our exercise classes. So please consider joining us. We do have, as Joan said, a great many classes. Um, Monday is tap, Tuesday is Zumba and Tai Chi, Wednesday's line dancing, Thursday's fitness and cardio, and Friday's Sama, which is all based on balance and um, core strength. So I don't have any more. Carrie, there's how also, about you? There's also Pilates uh, in that mix, right? Well, we do Pilates online right now. Mm -hmm. So that we also have in our news you can use in our bits, which are our emails, um, uh, lots and lots of links to our own exercise classes and others. And we also have links to all sorts of famous tours at libraries and museums and anything else that you can think of that might be fun. And you can find a lot of that information on our website as well, along with the link to the SNAP. Oh, that's terrific. Well, I, you know, the, the number of programs that you sponsor is just a, uh, uh, outstanding and uh, it's matched only by the percentage of participants in town. I think I think I looked at the, at the stats one time and 70% of the seniors in town have, have been a part of one program or another uh, during the year, which is phenomenal, uh, that level of participation. So, uh, and I think it's held pretty steady at, at that level. I think uh, with the, all the Zoom opportunities, uh, things have uh, continued to be very active in that respect. So uh, thank you for all that you do. It's just, tr it's just tremendous. I'm so happy to be here hosting this today. And I, I, I again, want to thank Liz and, and, uh, and Nick for uh, taking the time away from their very busy patient schedules to be with us. Um, thank you, Jean, uh, for sharing uh, what the friends do and Joan for the overview and Chuck, as always, for your wonderful technical support. It always seems to go without a hitch, it's great. And uh, to all the folks in our audience, please, please use this opportunity to learn uh, just how difficult life can be with this COVID. And uh, don't get complacent about it. Don't get uh, careless about it. Uh, you don't want to be involved in any way in, the, in this whole process if you can avoid it. So stay safe and uh, what did the guy on Hill Street Blues used to say? Be careful out there. Was that his uh, f uh, final uh, line? So be careful out there. Stay safe. Stay happy. We'll see you next month, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.